I'll only take five minutes to say uh, how we came up with the, uh, with the notion of, of this conference. And a number of you, especially those of you who are presenting, I think have been somewhat frustrated at various points when they've asked Cutler and myself uh, what we wanted out of their presentations and what we wanted out of their, their, uh, the, the conference. And our standard response was, we want whatever you want. Uh, and essentially, uh, that happens to be the truth. Uh, and we have, uh, we really have given you an underspecified idea of the conference because uh, in many ways what we are trying to do here is to get a collection of interesting people, those who are presenting as well as those who are in the room, uh, to indulge in a conversation, to partake in a conversation, to join in a conversation that has been ongoing for some time. Uh, and, and, and therefore, I think it is one of those, uh, one of those uh, few times when the underspecification is very much conscious. Uh, in, 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 in what, what, what we want to achieve. The pictures that just flashed, they're flashed for a purpose. And, and I want to say uh, what that purpose is. To the extent that, that we have a broad goal, uh, the goal is to advance our understanding of how, within quotes, great transformations in the human condition happen. And those pictures of people were uh, there because that at the core is, is at the core of what we are about uh, for today. Uh, trying to understand how the human condition uh, can be improved, but how it can be improved in these great transformations, which I'll say something about in a minute. Uh, as I said, it is, it is a dialogue and conversation is the right metaphor for what we want to do today. We want to end. We have a number of very good papers already in your packet. Uh, others have promised us that they will also be giving us papers. We do want, uh, at the end of this process, to come out with a book, uh, not as much of an academic book as a book of essays uh, that, uh, that reflects the conversations and dialogue that goes in today. And I, I use the, the metaphor of the dialogue uh, very, very seriously because it really started from a set of dialogues, dialogues between, between Fred Pardee and a number of us here, here at, at BU, uh, David Cutler, myself, John Gering, Strom Thacker, a number of other people, Robert, uh, and, and, uh, and also then uh, other people in the room, uh, Paul and others, on what these transformations are uh, and, and, and whether they can be made to happen. Uh, just two, two, two very uh, quick things that I want to say about sort of how we want to focus and how we came up with the way we've divided uh, the program. First of all, uh, we want to focus on issues of global change, not just global environmental change, but we're talking about change. That's, that's what we are here about. Can large-scale change, can large-scale transformations in the human condition happen? Uh, but we are focusing very much on the global. And can these happen at a global scale? Uh, we, we know transformations happen. Uh, we know that they have happened throughout history. We know that they matter. Uh, the question is, can they be made to happen and they, can they be sort of designed in some ways uh, so that positive improvement can happen, A, at the global scale? So, so global scale is, 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 is one of the defining features of, of what we hope we'll discuss. The other is we are interested in systemic change. Not, not sporadic change in particular areas, but can systemic change happen? change that, that changes uh, not only the system and therefore sort of moves the ocean liner in, in profound manners uh, from a trajectory where it is to a different and possibly uh, better trajectory. The third thing that sort of defines the type of transformation or change that we are talking about is we are particularly interested here in, in figuring out what we know, what we can learn, what we can think about the triggers of change. What are the things that can, that can trigger the big change? The, the action itself may not be big, but can, can trigger changes in domino effects that bring about uh, larger and, 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 and greater transformations. And finally, the type of change we are talking about, as, as I've already pointed out, is change in the human condition. Is, is change in, in, in the human condition. In, 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 and, and that's sort of uh, the, 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 the type of things we hope uh, we'll talk about. The way we've structured, uh, structured uh, the day, as you note, uh, and, and uh, I, I don't know whether it'll go this way or not, and in some ways it doesn't matter. <laughs> But just to, just to let you in on our initial thinking as we were trying to plan this, uh, the four sessions uh, that we will go through, uh, uh, two, two before lunch and two after lunch, are, are triggered uh, to do, uh, do, do 
three, three thoughts of things. That, that picture is wrong, but, but, but bear with me. It just happens to be my flag. It wasn't supposed to be there. The first is, is the visioning exercise. You can see there's a bit of cut and paste going on here. The first is a visioning exercise. And, and we, have, we, we have a wonderful, wonderful set of presentations uh, on, on that uh, about what are great, great transformations. Can we understand what we are talking about with these great transformations? Uh, there, 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 there have been a number. There, there is now a substantial literature on this. Uh, but where is our understanding of what a great transition or transformation is? The second is we want to move from from vision to insight, and the second uh, session uh, that happens before lunch uh, goes into uh, the issue of insight by asking how do transformations happen. And what it does is it tries to look historically at some of the great transitions uh, or trans uh, transformations. Uh, in particular, we will look at transformations in the energy sector that triggered big change, uh, and, and transformations in, in environment, and, and, and et cetera. And, and here the question is, how, what are the characteristics that define these great changes? Uh, and what we'll be looking at here, in fact, are things that were not willed, if you will, that happened. Accumulation of many historical events, many historical triggers that resulted in large changes over large uh, spans, uh, spans of time. Uh, the, third, uh, the third session we have is designed to focus on triggers. And as I said, this is far, far, this sounds much more neat than what I hope will happen. I hope it's not this neat and the conversation will sort of spill between, uh, between, between sessions. But the third session we have, what we envisage to do is, is to try to look at the triggers. And, and what drives transformations. And in particular, what we've tried to do in, in asking people to talk in this session is to think about transformations which were in some way willed, which were in some very nebulous way planned. And, and sort of my favorite exemplar of this, and, and, and this really comes from, from uh, Tariq Banuri, who will be speaking and possibly speaking about this also, uh, is, is the Green Revolution. You, no matter where you stand on it, and I have some serious concerns about it in some ways, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that it was a planned exercise. That more amazing than simply the food production aspect of it is the, f is, is, is the aspect that the world got together and said, well, here's a problem. This is what we want to do about it. This is how we're going to do about it. And then in a planned way, and you can talk about what dates and what meetings were held and how they went about it. And, and you can quibble with, with the results. But, but there was a certain plannedness to it. And there is a certain plannedness to what you heard uh, last night, those of you who were there at the dinner with the Millennium Development Goals. And there are a number of these efforts to bring about large transformations. And we want to figure out whether we know something about what works and what doesn't and what are the characteristics. And finally, in, in, uh, in the last session, we want to look at, 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 a, at, at sort of potentials of what could be and, and think about a few, few examples of what may be, we aren't sure, of what may be uh, transformations uh, in the making. And, and we, have, we have a couple of very interesting uh, presentations on that. Uh, so, so by way of my, my, our purpose in that, Cutler and I, what we wanted to do with this was to, uh, to mainly sort of put forth to you our sense of where we are starting from as we, as we put together this conference. Uh, we are not sure whether this is where we'll end. And, and we will uh, not at all be concerned if this is not where we end, uh, as long as where we end is someplace uh, interesting and hopefully more interesting than where we began. So thank you very much, all of you, for being here. Uh, I'll ask uh, Robert Kaufman uh, from the Department of Geography and the Center for en Energy and Environmental Studies, who is the chair of the first session, uh, to take over uh, things now. Robert? Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you, Adil. Actually, don't go too far, Adil, because uh, there's been a slight change in the program. The first speaker could not make it. And so planning for a minor transformation, we're going to have Adil speak first. And it has fallen upon me to uh, introduce Adil. Unfortunately, I did not get a chance to read his bio. But fortunately, I don't really need one in that up until very recently, a deal was here at Boston University in the Department of International Relations. Since then, he is now at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. And boy, I wish I had more concrete things to say about what a wonderful person and an excellent researcher he is. But anyway, here's a deal. Thank you. I, I wish I had a more concrete life. Uh, <laughs> 
I, I think uh, I, what I should really do is, 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 is talk about uh, whose presentation this is. First of all, uh, try not to see me because uh, this is not me, it's merely my voice. Uh, Robert Prescott Allen, who's our first presenter, unfortunately could not make it uh, from the West Coast uh, in, in Canada. He's, he's terribly, terribly uh, he, uh, sad about that and, and apologized, but it was, it was a type of emergency that he could simply not do anything about. He did, however, uh, prepare both a paper and a presentation, and he, he sent me the presentation last night uh, and, and asked if, if I could give it on his behalf. Uh, Robert Prescott Allen, for those of you who, uh, who, who may not, not know him, is it is sad that he is not presenting this. A, because he's a wonderful, wonderful present, presenter and, and a very funny but serious person. Uh, and, and a very insightful and uh, innovative uh, thinker. And uh, he's been a consultant on environment and development issues for very, very long. Uh, worked amongst other things, was the principal author of something uh, called the World Conservation Strategy Two. Uh, the second of the World Conservation Strategy series by the World Conservation Union. Uh, he, he lives in Canada, and for the last many years, uh, he's been consumed by uh, his work on measuring uh, well-being of nations. And what he, he has sent us is really based partly on, on, on that work, which also resulted in, in a book called The Well-Being well -being of Nations. When this work started about seven or eight years ago, he and I worked fairly closely on this. The only other thing I would say about Robert is that if he were here and gave you his visiting card, it would say, uh, Robert Prescott Allen, eco-gastronomist. <laughs> and you will see why. He takes food very, very seriously. And it is reflected entirely in his work. And therefore, what he has started here with is talking, uh, giving us the metaphor for great transformations. And that is the egg of well-being. Uh, and his egg of well-being is, is a rather simple but, 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 but strikingly powerful idea. And the idea is that much like an egg, uh, the ecosystem, the Earth system, if you will, is surrounded, uh, surrounds and supports people much as the white of an egg surrounds and supports the yolk. So that, and, and it's, it sounds simple, but, but sort of, at least within the academic literature, it's, it's a rather controversial idea that, that people are within, in, in some circles it's a controversial idea, that people are within the ecosystem, they are part of ecosystem. And much like an egg, uh, the total system is good, is considered to be good if both the yellow and the white if both the earth system and the human system, the ecological well-being and the human well-being, are both good. And if either is not good, then that egg of well-being as a whole is not good. So, so that, that sort of is, is, is the simple uh, notion that he's starting with. And, and the argument is that a society is well and sustainable only if both people and the earth system uh, is, uh, are, are well and, and, and doing good. And, and he tells the story, and I wish he were telling the story because he would have told it be better, but, but he says in the beginning, people behaved as if they were an integral part of the ecosystem. They behaved as if they were an integral part of the ecosystem because they depended on that earth system for the resources they had for the food and so on and so forth. And, 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 and it was a much more equal relationship, if you will. And then on a gray day in the year 7005 BC, or somewhere around there, uh, someone felt like a loaf of bread and a jug of wine, and thus started the agricultural revolution, the first of the great transformations. And, and he would argue that the biggest of the great transformations as far as, as uh, on, on a planetary scale. And people still felt that they were part of the ecosystem, of the Earth system, but, but, but uh, could do a lot more to it. That their influence on that white, the influence of the yellow on the white, became far greater than it was, though it still remained a, a, a mutually uh, synergistic relationship. On another gray day, I don't know how he figured these were gray days, but, but um, I, I believe him if he says so. Uh, 1775, I also don't know where the date, uh, he gets to these exact, exact dates. Uh, he asked me to hum Mozart here. I, 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 that, I'm sorry, is not part of the job description at all. And I shall not, uh, I, I shall not, not, not uh, take you through that. But uh, apart from Mozart, uh, you get the steam engine. And apart from the steam engine, and because of things like that, you get the Industrial Revolution. Uh, 
And what the Industrial Revolution does as a transformation is that this relationship between the two becomes detached. That in, in, in some ways, uh, what it does is it gives us humans the ability uh, to far more overwhelm our surrounding uh, ecological system than we had before that. Uh, my, 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 if, if I might take an aside, my, my colleague and friend Wolfgang Sachs and others have also argued this, but, but uses the metaphor of when, uh, when man saw Earth from space for the first time as one of those transforming moments. Because every metaphor we had of our, our home got changed. Uh, if, if you can think of that picture in your head, you're know, looking from space, and it's this beautiful, wondrous blue crystal ball out there in the midst of nothingness. Right? A, it highlighted just how alone we were. Because all those pictures, the background is all black. Uh, at least in the picture, there's nothingness. And B, you get this image of this fragile thing, something you have to hold and nourish uh, and, 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 and take care of, which is very different from earlier image, pre-Mozart images of Earth, which is the great adversary, something you fight against or something you conquer. Uh, and, and that's the type of thing uh, that Robert is talking about here. And he says that this, this transformation uh, continues in its various dimensions today. And it has been widening the cognitive divorce between culture and nature. It has been adding more energy and ingenuity to the pursuit of wealth, uh, but getting less human well-being per unit of wealth and more environmental stress. Uh, so that's the contention. Uh, this, this slide didn't come through. And yet, and this is the big point he's making. Uh, he, 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 we are not going to go into sort of the details of his number crunching. Those who have seen his work in Wellbeing of Nations, it's a very number-driven uh, endeavor. But, but this, in some ways, is the big result. And the yellow, yellow line there is the measurement of human well-being. We'll come in a second to what, how, how he measures it. And the uh, blue lines that go up and down are ESI, which is the Ecological uh, Sustainability Index. And the big points he wanted me to make, make about this were, first, that ecosystem stress is not an inevitable byproduct of human well-being. That's an important contention. That, that to increase human well-being, you do not necessarily have to trade off against environmental quality. That, that there are multiple paths to achieve human well-being, economic well-being, uh, development, and you make a choice of which path you take. And, and we'll hear more about those paths much, much more later on. But you, you make that choice. And, and it is a matter of choice rather than inevitability that if you're going to have better human well-being, you have to somehow sacrifice uh, the quality of the Earth's Earth system uh, surrounding it. Uh, the third, he, he argues that a third great transformation is now needed, and it is needed to rebuild the marriage between culture, nature, and to achieve high levels of human well-being. Because I mean, that's 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 the other important con contention: uh, that that you do not you do not sacrifice human well-being for the pursuit of ecological well-being. If, if you understand the egg metaphor right, you want both. And high levels of human well-being, you want to sustain, uh, sustain uh, and high levels of ecosystem well-being, because ecosystems support life and makes it possible to have. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a snapshot of what his map of, um, uh, of, of well-being of nations looks like. And essentially what he does is he, he measures these two things, uh, ecosystem well-being and human well-being. Uh, and and uh, I'll say a bit, but not too much, uh, about this, uh, because, because the purpose is sort of to, to focus on, on the big contentions rather than the methodology alone. Uh, but if you look at it, uh, the two are measured, and the two are measured not as trade-offs, but, but as, as, as necessary conditions. And you can be good in one and not good in the other, and vice versa, and so on and so forth. And these are these big bands. The top, top one becomes what he calls nirvana, uh, and, and you, get, you get high countries, you, you get a human well-being gap. For example, between Somalia uh, at the bottom and Norway at the top. You get another ecosystem well-being gap, for example, between Malta at one end and the Republic of Congo at another. And then you get an overall well-being gap. And, and the two examples he has there is Iraq and, and, and Sweden. But the argument is that you can measure these things differently and you come up with different answers. And his contention is you have to measure the two things together. Uh, and how to get there, he points to two key 
key elements. One is the need for a commitment to the goal of human and ecosystem well-being together, the motivation. Uh, and, and this is what brings us into political motivation, and societal motivation. Uh, and the other, he argues, is the need for regular assessment. That in fact, there is an important role to constantly assess where we are and constantly course correct where we are going. And well-being assessments provide a, a way of measuring progress towards that goal by making the goals measurable, a means of making it achievable. That, that if you're going to course, if you're going to chart a course toward the great transformation, we want to constantly measure how we are doing it. And even if the measures are imperfect, uh, you want some sense of whether you are in the right direction or not. And an analytical tool for deciding priority actions and a process to keep the goal constantly in mind and to help people learn how to use it. Uh, the challenge is you need enough high-quality indicators to cover human and ecosystem well-being comprehensively. And, and the well-being uh, in indexes that he used, as I think, uses something like 300 different indicators which are, which are joined together in, in various ways. You need to produce a clear and simple message that can be understand, understood by society and understood by decision makers. And the well-being assessment's response is first decide what to measure, decide how to measure it, and create a picture of what, what the, uh, the, where you are overall. Uh, very briefly, just on, on methodology, the way he, he does it, you want to end up with this one picture of system, uh, system well-being. And he divides that system well-being then between people well-being and ecosystem well-being. And within each, he has dimensions which are groups of goals. Uh, elements which are objectives that lead to those goals. Uh, uh, Sub-elements, uh, indicators, objectives, and finally, indicators of, of performance criteria. And you go down this, and then you add those numbers up and come back up. And again, I won't, won't go through it, but, but the basic, basic philosophy is if, for example, you're doing human, human uh, dimension, human well-being, uh, long lives in good health and a stable population. Right? So, the, so, so health is a, is a key, uh, key, key element, health and population. Uh, you need wealth to secure the basic needs and decent livelihoods. Uh, you need knowledge and culture to live and uh, live well and sustainably. And if you look at look at the methodology, the type of numbers he uses are similar to the type of numbers that Cutler and I will talk in the afternoon, uh, in 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 our, our, our about our web page. So so he has sort of issues about culture. He has issues about knowledge. He has issues about happiness. And and so it's not simply wealth. Uh, you you embellish them uh, with things that people value. Uh, you need a community that upholds the rights of its members. Uh, and and finally, you need benefits and burdens to be equitably uh, shared. I'll end with this, this last one, which is how he measures ecosystem dimension. Actually, I'll, I'll just uh, push forward. But uh, So there's land ecosystem, uh, there is water ecosystem, there is air ecosystem, and there are species uh, that live in the system. And, and again, those are, those, uh, those are collected in order to, 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 to measure this, uh, in, in, in this in this fashion. Uh, I just want to. Uh, so, so how, do you, how do you use this? First, you can find it to, to assess where we are. Second, you, are, you can assess it to how are we making progress by, by using a temporal. So if you, if you see uh, the UK uh, going up on, on human well-being, uh, but slightly worse on well-being, ecosystem well-being over that decade. And so you can track your progress over time with tools like, like this is one issue. The other is, because it is an aggregated index, you can then break up the index and say, OK, what is keeping you down? What is keeping you from making the progress you ought to, ought, ought to make? Uh, and and is, it, is it, for example, uh, so in, in this example, it is, is it the community and equity things that are taking you down, uh, either bo uh, going down or going left, leftwards on your screen? And therefore, it becomes a tool for decision makers to say, OK, we are doing well or we are not doing well. And these are the things where we are doing worst. And therefore, these are the things that need policy attention so that we can do better. And, and so the, the argument of, of the whole, whole issue here, and I hope I've done some justice to what, what he wanted me to say, uh, but the key argument is that if you can, you have to define what the goal is. And for him, that is net well-being, ecosystem, and, health, uh, and, and human. And then you have to constantly monitor and course correct the progress towards it. Uh, so thank you very much. I hope I, 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 I did justice to, to what he had to say. Thank you. I, I think what, what 
planners of the meeting would like to do is have both speakers speak, and then at the end we'll have except in, the, except in this session. Except in this session, because we have to swap out computers. So if we want to take some questions now while I set it up, Paul's talk that would be fine, I think. So why don't we go ahead and open things up? Yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure I can answer entirely for Robert, but uh, but sure. <laughs> See, this 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 is this is my penalty for not being here yesterday for dinner. So 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 they made me do this. <laughs> uh, any any sort of uh, s s basic questions on 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 what he had? Yes, sir. Well, it just, just a comment. I, <clears throat> if you're going to have some kind of measurable measure of how well you're doing to get to the upper right hand right, measurement of how you're doing to get to the upper right hand corner, uh, you have a two dimensional diagram like that's a partial of your ordered set. It's not a linear order set. So what you're talking about is a pathway to the upper right hand corner which might entail in some circumstances going backward on one measure and forward on another. Uh, it seems to be there's a lot of possibilities here. Right. And uh, I, I don't know how Robert would, would answer that. I've had conversations with him but not on that particular thing. I, I, I th my own sense is you're right. Uh, and, and that is one of the choice uh, that, that you make. Also if you recall the graph that he had about uh, sort of putting all the countries in and seeing how the two correlate, uh, you can actually say, OK, I'm going to uh, just you know, pollute like hell and uh, get rich and then buy my way into human well-being. Uh, and, and there are many who would argue, who have argued that you can do, you, you do that, that you, you can go dirty and there's something like an environmental Kuznets curve. Uh, on the other hand, the other side would argue, well, uh, there, are, there are limits here that you might hit in doing that, which are non-reversible. And then once you come to those limits, no matter how, how rich you are, you cannot actually buy your way back. Uh, you actually cannot buy back a species that you've lost, and, and so on and so forth. But, but I think you are right that, that there are multiple paths. Uh, to those, and, and that is one of the decision makers' parameter, uh, which uh, measuring tools can only sort of point you towards, but ultimately is depends on motivations of leadership and of uh, of uh, societies. Tariq. Well, up on that, uh... Does does Robert have uh, some way of uh, including irreversibilities into his, his, his analysis? Because this is a very linear, uh, you know, it, it, and yeah. irreversibilities have a non-linear thing. So does he have anything like that or? Uh? I may be doing injustice to him, but as far as I know, no. And, and if he were here, you know, I mean, in, uh, having read his work extensively and talked to him, I, I, I do know sort of the, the point he makes is that a number is only as good or as bad as the user. And, and, and ultimately, the responsibility for decisions uh, lies with societies and individuals and decision makers, uh, and not with the numbers they use. But but the short answer to your question is in the methodology, no. And the uh, oh, the, the one 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 place that maybe he does is in the weightage, because the way the, the things are aggregated, uh, each is given a weight, uh, and and sort of species loss I know has given a very high weight. But but that doesn't fully respond to irreversibility. It just says you you value it slightly higher. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll, we'll take the last question. I was interested question one of the, uh, okay. especially after what you said about seeing the Earth from space, I was interested to see a lot of individual eggs instead of one big egg. And one of the things that I've, I find interesting is part of the cleanup of the U.S. and Northern Europe has been the export of more polluting industries to developing nations. I'm not sure how that would be figured into it, but it would be nice to see that as part of the analysis. Right, and, and, uh, and, and there I know what he would say. Uh, one of the things is that uh, the tool, uh, he would say, is, can be used at multiple levels, and actually he is using it at multiple levels. For, for example, he now has these Canada-wide eggs. Uh, so you have an, an egg in Winnipeg, and you have an egg in Ottawa. And, and uh, the Canadian government has had a well-being of Canada report. So, so you can use similar methods to then see at, an, at a disaggregated. And, and you know, ultimately, you could have 6 billion eggs, though the, the graph would be a little crowded. Uh, but, but, but you're right, because if you get that picture, what you'll see is that one egg for a country sort of camouflages uh, lots of things. Uh, and and they are sort of different parts within the egg that, that are going on. Yes, sir. The uh, example of the egg might be a bit counterproductive mm -hmm. because the purpose 
of the white of the egg is to be eaten by the yellow of the egg to have a system's transformation to turn into a chicken. <laughs> now, if you carry that into the earth, then the purpose of the environment is to support the evolution of the human to be born as a species beyond the star. That's probably not what he's talking about. I hope not. <laughs> I, I do promise to convey that, that metaphor to him <laughs> and, and, and will not even try to. Try to but, 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 yeah. The idea of an equilibrium between the white and the yellow is not the way nature works. Yeah, and and I think sort of his his egg is probably the static at the point of of the egg, and 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 uh, not not when it becomes uh, becomes a chicken. Uh, but but yes, yes, <laughs> okay, yes, sir. I wanted to get a little more insight into what's being called human well-being. Uh, human well-being, as it's been described here, is, is it really is sort of a proxy of the life that we would like to live, we like our children to live, uh, in essentially the life that makes us happy. And in some sense, that human well-being is, is a proxy for what people are starting to explore now, is how do you measure human happiness? Very difficult thing, and it's often very uncorrelated with we wealth and other types of things and relationships and all sorts to come in. How do you deal with that in this context, particularly when people, be, people's behavior, particularly in their economic market decisions, what they buy, how they allocate their resources, often confound what we would consider good uh, for their well-being. Um, certainly when I go out and go skiing, I spend a lot of money going skiing, it's uh, often a, uh, a health risky behavior, and yet, and it would drive down my human well-being index and yet it's a very clearly a conscious decision that I make to pursue it for another purpose. And, ha and in some sense, that's the driver of human behavior. Six billion people behaving, you know, 100 times a day to do their own personal happiness, not necessarily driving towards their personal well-being. Well, my sense would be ultimately well-being is what people believe it to be. And if, if I, for some odd reason, believe bungee jumping is what's going to make me happy, I, I can't foresee myself doing it, but I know people who do. Uh, and if, if that is what gives someone happiness, then that is what is happiness, uh, happiness for, for, for him. And, and for what, what Robert is, I think, trying here, and, and others like the Human Development Index does, does in a yet smaller way, and he, does, he expands it because he expands the number of things he's putting into the mix, is saying, well, happiness is derived from multiple sources, uh, and all of them are valid even when contradictory. That, 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 that I, I get a certain pleasure from bungee jumping, and I, I value my health also. And I actually am a complex enough being to do both. And in my everyday life, I actually balance them. And therefore, in our measurement of what people consider their well-being, we should also value both. And if they, if they contradict, that is fine. I mean, it, it will cancel out at some level and, and come to. So what he's reacting to, I think, more is the, the, uh, the reduction of it to a single dimension, such as, for example, uh, wealth, right? which is how we do GDP, for example. Uh, and, and sort of recognizing that whether the chicken or not, uh, human beings and their understanding of their own well-being is a complex and sometimes contradictory um, uh, affair. And, and, and my guess is he's saying that's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's not easy being Robert, no. Uh, if I were presenting, no one would have asked anything. <laughs> well, he has solved the question of which comes first. You never get to the chicken. <laughs> oh, you got the chicken next. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I happen to like his schema, but my question is, how is it, or what is it that makes this a great transformation? Uh, the, the contention is, 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 in talking to him last night, is that this is the, the egg itself is not, not, not the great transformation. Uh, but if you want a great transformation which, uh, which entails uh, well-being across the world, uh, and sort of, sort of a ba balance both between human and ecological well-being, then here is a tool to help you as you chart that course. 
So, so what he's presenting here is not as much a vision of what that transformation or post-transformation would look like. I'm, we are hoping to get that from Paul. But uh, he, he's saying that as you go on that path, mm -hmm. here is a good tool to keep in your pocket uh, because you are dealing with this, this long-term enterprise so that it can at least guide you as you make mistakes on the way or as you do good things on the way and, and it, it, it can guide you to what is working and what is not. Uh, and that's why his stress on assessment comes in uh, rather than the vision itself. Thank you very much. At this point, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Paul Raskin. As an academic, he was trained in physics, and he worked in the, at the university level for a little while thereafter. But in 1976, he founded or helped found the TELUS Institute, which is a local energy and environmental consulting company. There he's developed several models dealing with water and energy. Based upon the expertise in those areas, his input has been used by several international organizations such as the United Nations, the World Bank, and he's been active in the IPCC process. So at that, this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Raskin. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. There's been a slight change of plans. I'm actually going to be presenting Adil Najam's uh, <laughs> talk here. So you will bear with me. Uh, well, I guess the point of departure of my comments this morning is the premise that civilization, can we shut this? That civilization is in the midst of a fundamental transformation with implications that are as significant, perhaps, as earlier great transitions to settled agriculture and industrial society. It seems that some form of planetary society will take shape over the coming decades, but that its ultimate character remains profoundly uncertain. Now, these days, people seem to find it all too easy as they scan the global scene, you know, so full of peril and antagonism, to envision a very gloomy future, a world of impoverished people, culture, and nature. But taking a, a, an adage from Lewis Mumford, you know, I'm pessimistic on the probabilities, but optimistic on the possibilities. For the future, it's not somewhere we're going, it's something we're creating. And while it may seem improbable, a transition to a future of enriched lives, of human solidarity, and a healthy planet is still possible. And that's the uh, argument that was developed in this recent essay, A Great Transition, The Promise and Lure of the Times Ahead, by the Global Scenario Group. A quick word about the Global Scenario Group. Uh, it was formed in 1995, convened by the Stockholm Environment Institute to engage a rather diverse international group in an ongoing exploration of the requirements for a sustainable world. Uh, and as was mentioned, this work has been relied on in a number of global and regional assessments, including the UNEP's Global Environmental Outlook Series. Now, this research actually sits on a small mountain of data and simulation and analysis. And I'm going to spare you the numbers here. Uh, indeed, I can only offer you here a rather impressionistic, indeed imagistic uh, sketch of some of the uh, main ideas. But if you'd like to dig deeper, you can go to the Global Scenario Group's website, gsg.org. Now, transitions and phase shifts are everywhere in, in nature. Many physical, biophysical systems develop gradually, enter a period of rapid transformation, and eventually reach a new state of relative stability. And we can track change through the phases of takeoff, acceleration, and stabilization. But with the emergence of proto-humans, a powerful new factor, cultural development, accelerated change on the planet and brought a new kind of transition in between the phases of human history. 
Now, of course, there are no sharp demarcations. History is a messy business. And transition everywhere, by the way, are scale dependent. You see them or you don't, depending on the, the length of your measuring stick for both spatial and temporal dimensions. But I think with a long view, two grand transformations are revealed in human history. Stone Age culture evolved over roughly 100,000 years before early civilization arose roughly 10,000 years ago, which in turn gave rise to the modern era over the last millennium. We claim now that we're in the midst of a third great transformation to what we call the planetary phase of history. And we seem to be about there. Now note that if this transition were to take of the order of 100 years, a pattern of acceleration of historical eras would continue. And that's uh, illustrated here by switching to a logarithmic scale for the time axis. Now over this long period, the complexity of society increases across many dimensions. Social organization moves from the level of the tribe to the city state, to the nation, to the planetary system of our time. The economic basis from hunting and gathering to settled agriculture, to industrialization and the global economy. And communication from the evolution of language to writing, to printing, to modern information technology and so on. Now the defining feature I think of the planetary transition is increased global connectivity. There are numerous early expressions of this including the formation of the United Nations and as we just heard the Apollo 8 mission that set, transmitted everybody's logo from outer space, you know, that iconic image of our blue planet adrift in the cosmos. But the real takeoff, I think, was over the last couple of decades. And the signals included environmental change at the scale of the biosphere, the revolution in information and communications technology that's shrinking our world, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the increasing hegemony of capitalism, economic globalization and the growing importance of such actors as the WTO, multinational corporations, the emergence of a new global species, Davos Man. And at the same time, we had the Earth Summit, the emergence of globally linked NGOs as an important force in world affairs, and a new species of global skeptic, Seattle woman. Now we should also mention here globally connected terrorism, since fundamentalist reaction and great power counter reaction is also part of the story of planetary transition. Now as these trends and driving forces evolve and interact with new contingencies, factors and behaviors, the global trajectory can branch into very different trajectories, very different directions. It seems that we live in a critical time, a time for choices where the decisions we make now can fundamentally influence the, the direction of development. Now, of course, we can't predict the future for three distinct, due to three distinct kinds of uncertainty. Ignorance, our understanding of the current conditions and the forcing striving change are just too weak. But even if we knew everything, if we were omniscient and this were a deterministic system, we still couldn't predict because this is a complex socio-ecological system that has the capacity for emergent behaviors, novel phenomena, and unexpected events. And the future is uncertain for a third reason. It depends on human choices that haven't yet been made. Indeed, human choices that can depend reflexively on thinking about the future and if visions of the future can act as both attractors or repulsors in this dynamic. So while we can't predict the future, scenarios do help us to scan the possibilities, to understand the choices better, and to act wisely. So scenarios are essentially plausible stories about the pos possibilities that can be told in both words and numbers. Indeed, I think the cutting edge of scenario research today, and this is a very young discipline, is 
in combining the richness of narrative with the rigor of quantitative modeling. But scenarios provide a powerful methodology for thinking about the future in an organized and systemic way. And the integrated view is fundamental to the very notion of sustainable development, integration across sectors, across themes, but also across spatial scales, because different issues come into focus as we zoom across different levels of spatial resolution. But as the global system becomes more connected, the fate of regions and nations becomes more tightly coupled to the fate of the global system. So the old adage of think globally, act locally, then would require its complement. Think locally, act globally. So consider with me three classes of scenarios, conventional worlds, barbarization, and great transition. Conventional, conventional worlds evolve gradually from the dominant forces of globalization. Economic interdependence increases apace, dominant cultural values spread, developing regions gradually converge towards the consumption and production patterns of the rich countries. Barbarization, on the other hand, uh, is a very different picture. Here, social polarization, environmental deterioration, economic instability feed back and amplify, uh, leading to a general global crisis and an erosion of civilized norms. While in great transitions, people respond to the sustainability challenge with fundamentally different values, a sense of human solidarity and deep respect for nature. So two variations on conventional worlds we call market forces and policy reform. Market forces uh, features uh, uh, powerful actors driving the priority of economic growth. While policy reform would add the counterweight of strong governmental initiatives to constrain and redirect the global economy in order to achieve a broad set of environmental and social goals. Two kinds of barbarization scenarios are fortress world and breakdown. In fortress world features an authoritarian response to the threat of global crisis. A kind of global apartheid is imposed with elites in protected enclaves and an impoverished majority outside. I've been stunned how many people seem to think that fortress world is the real business as usual scenario. In breakdown crisis, conflicts spiral out of control and institutions collapse. Two kinds of great transitions we call eco-communalism and the new sustainability paradigm. Eco-communalism is a highly localist vision that's favored by uh, a number of environmental and anarchist subcultures and is a prominent theme within the anti-globalization movement. Uh, but the new sustainability paradigm sees in globalization not only a threat but also an opportunity to forge new categories of consciousness, global citizenship, humanity as a whole, and its place in the web of life and its link to the fate of the earth. So the new sustainability paradigm would seek to change the character of global civilization rather than retreat into localism. So it validates ideas of global solidarity, cultural cross-fertilization, interdependence, while seeking a humanistic and ecological transition. Now the first wave of sustainable development from Stockholm in 72 through the Brundtland Report in the 80s, Rio in 92, all the way through Joburg last year, centered here on the policy reform vision. That started the transition. But to complete it, we argue, would need the new development paradigm of the great transition. Now these visions of the future are really fundamentally different worldviews that are rooted in the history of ideas. The archetypal social visions refracted through modern lenses. 
To explore that further, here are scenarios again, three classes, great transitions, barbarization and conventional worlds, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and two variations within each for a total of six scenarios. So with tongue firmly in cheek, let me ask uh, what might be the antecedents, a thumbnail sketch of the philosophy, and a motto for each of these points of view. Well, a precursor, precursor of the market forces uh, idea is probably a good one would be Adam Smith and the philosophy of market optimism and faith in the hidden hand, and the motto, don't worry, be happy. The policy reform, we might think of, of Keynes, and in a more modern context, the Brundtland Commission, the philosophy of policy stewardship, environment and equity through better technology and management. Uh, a harbinger of breakdown, I guess, would be Parson Malthus, the philosophy of existential gloom, of the inevitability of population and resource catastrophe. The end is coming. The fortress world is kind of a Hobbesian place with the, always the threat of social chaos and concern about the very character of human nature. Motto, order through strong leaders. The eco-communalism, one might think of the 19th century social philosophers and in a very different context, the traditionalism of Gandhi. And here there's a strain of pastoral romance and an ultimate faith in human nature and a rejection of industrial, industrialism. And the motto, of course, is small is beautiful. Uh, new sustainability paradigm? Well, there are many uh, streams that flow into this river, but it could be that the definitive statement has not yet been written. You know, so hey, let's talk. You know. <laughs> so this is the philosophy of sustainability as progressive global social, social evolution. And the motto, human solidarity, new values, the art of living. But this categorization actually leaves out the most common viewpoint of all, which is having absolutely no vision. And this is a vast group of the unaware, the unconvinced, the unconcerned. And a very good example of that is my own brother-in-law. I could tell <laughs> and, and I suspect there's someone around your Thanksgiving uh, dinner table that fits the bill as, uh, as well. Uh, you have a flash of recognition. <laughs> and this is the philosophy of muddle through, no grand philosophies, que sera, sera. And finally, just for fun, let's ask each of these representatives to comment on the metaphor, society is a ship in troubled waters. So the market uh, optimists say, onward, keep the shops and casinos open. The uh, reformists improve the navigation system, call a meeting. And I can tell you, I've been to a lot of meetings, and I suspect <laughs> you may have as well. The catastrophists remember the Titanic, we're sinking exponentially. <laughs> and the authoritarians, oh captain, my captain, beware of mutiny, secure the first class deck. And the communalists abandon ship, sail to tranquil ponds in small boats. And these new paradigm characters, look a passage to a better sea, if, if, if. And my brother-in-law, wake me if something happens. <laughs> well, in fact, the global scene is a complex mixture of multiple worldviews and tendencies, and will be for some time. But the question is, is there a pathway, if not to a great transition, to a pretty good transition uh, of a sustainable and desirable future? Now, the uh, grand, almost utopian vision of market forces is to forge a globally integrated free market. But the risk is, is that it would succumb to its own contradictions, environmental degradation despite technological advance, human desperation despite growth in aggregate wealth, and cultural polarization despite greater global interdependence. 
Well, if market adaptations are insufficient, then environmental stress, inequity, resentment, conflict, and xenophobia could reinforce and amplify. And out of the turbulence, a fortress world could consolidate. This would be a tragic negation of the hopes for a better world. Now, from the agony of the 20th century, those hopes were crystallized in four great aspirations for global society. Peace, freedom, material well-being, and a healthy environment. But the trends are perilous. Conflict, inequity, poverty persist while the global environment deteriorates. A sustainable world would require bending these curves sharply towards far less conflict, greater freedom, less poverty, and environmental renewal. Now, the reform path would take up the challenge, but is it enough? Well, detailed analysis strongly suggests that it is feasible in principle in the sense that there, the necessary technologies and policy instruments are available for going a long way toward harmonizing vast economic growth with a wide set of environmental and social goals. But that it's terribly daunting in practice that gradually bending highly unsustainable trends imposes immense technical and managerial challenges. It's trying to, we're trying to go up the down escalator. And the critical question remains, where would the political will come from for this vast program? So reform may not be enough. But even if it were technologically and politically feasible, and that's a big if, another question would remain, a normative question. Does it represent a desirable vision of the future? Or might it lead to a sustainable but undesirable world, a kind of well-engineered global mall where the environment continues to function in some sense and fewer people starve, but not a place of human exploration and contentment? The redefinition of the meaning of the good life is fundamental to the new sustainability paradigm. It goes back to the question asked long ago by Socrates, how shall we live? So this is a values-led scenario that prioritizes the quality of life, not just the quantity of things, strong human ties, and humanity as part of a vibrant community of life on planet Earth. And it's a pluralistic scenario that recognizes multiple pathways to modernity and where regions pursue diverse forms of development, often based on local traditions and customs. Now, conventional world strategies operate on the proximate drivers that directly influence demographics, the economy, technology, and institutions. Uh, a great transition would need to go to the ultimate drivers that shape society and the human experience values, knowledge, power, and culture. Now, proximate drivers are responsive, or can be responsive at least, to short-term interventions, while ultimate drivers are subject to the gradual political and cultural processes that can actually expand the frontier of the possible by changing the basis for human choice. Market forces maintain the correlation between the sense of well-being, material consumption, and throughput, the material flow through an economy. Now, policy reform would decouple consumption from throughput through better technology, a dematerialization wedge. A great transition would add a lifestyle wedge that passed a satisfactory standard of living for everyone would break the link between well-being and consumption. Regarding equity, in market forces, the gap between rich and poor tends to widen. 
And at the bottom of the income pyramid, a billion people remain mired in absolute poverty. The policy reform would seek to bring up the bottom through targeted policies to eradicate poverty, the poverty spring. Well, a great transition is rooted in building more equitable relations, an equity clamp. Now, a great transition would, in fact, involve sub-transitions in all aspects of culture. A values transition would counter individualism, materialism, and the domination of nature. A knowledge transition would highlight systemic approaches. A demographic transition would stabilize populations and build sustainable communities. A social transition would ensure universal rights and eliminate poverty. An economic transition would make the economy a means of serving people and sparing nature. A governance transition would build partnerships among stakeholders at all levels. And a technology transition would certainly include deep efficiency, renewables, and industrial ecology. Now, what social actors might carry a great transition forward? Well, there are no easy answers. Uh, it would no doubt involve a multitude of players, north and south, east and west. But let me focus on four possible agents of change. Three are global actors, intergovernmental organizations, civil society, the private sector. Will governmental and business organizations reinvent themselves? Or perhaps the most important question of all, will civil society be able to overcome its fragmentation and begin to unify around a common vision and framework and principles? Well, the answers depend ultimately probably on the fourth category, the quality of awareness and engagement of the citizens of the world. I find it very difficult to envision a great transition without a global citizens movement for one. So the first wave of sustainability centered on better technology, poverty alleviation, and incremental changes to market-driven development. Now we need a second wave that brings human values, lifestyles, and institutions to the forefront of debate, action, and research. I think a great trans transition would require that we advance a new paradigm of global development that can challenge current thinking, that can seize the popular Im imagination, and expand the basis for political change. And I think in this process, sustainability is really only the necessity that pushes a great transition. It's the vision of a better life that needs to be the magnet to pull it forward. But the curve of development would have to be bent twice. A radical revision of technological means can begin the transition, but a redefinition, a re-exploration of human goals would be needed to complete it. And that, I submit, is the promise and lure of the times ahead. Thanks very much. Don't escape that easy. <laughs> Do you want to call on people? Should I? Whatever. Oh, I, I, I really very much like the, the way the scenario group has unfolded this in a way you, you presented this. I, I, I think it makes lots and lots of sense. The, the question I want to ask is one that I started to ask you last night at the reception, and, and as receptions mill around, we got interrupted, and, and, and I didn't get to, to close it. But it's the tension between the, the material and the ideational understandings of how transitions occur. And I think this will probably come up during the day in, in, other, in, in other ways. Transitions historically have, of, have most often, I would argue, occurred because of of the material side of things. Uh, uh, 
when, when nation states came into being, uh, there, were, there were benefits that were attained by those who brought them into being, by those who organized power, who, who took resources and used it in different ways. Uh, when energy transitions occur, uh, people uh, in industry or, 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 or consumers had benefits that, that accrued to them as a result of moving to another form of technology. Uh, transitions are often are material driven. Uh, the, the Marxist argument is, is the same. When we talk about the Great Transition, we often talk in ideation or idealistic terms. This is something we should move towards, uh, and we should uh, make these kinds of changes in the way society works, and, and closing the, uh, the uh, imposing the equity clamp and so on. It's harder for me to see the material forces in these actors and the way they, they, they will interplay the, uh, in, in bringing about the great transition. Uh, the, the incentives of NGOs to, to change these structures, the incentives of, of intergovernmental organizations to change the structures are not as clear to me in the great transition as they were in the historic ones. And I'm sure you're struggling with this yourself to some degree. Uh, I have always one foot in the material and one foot in the ideational world, so to speak, and, and it's an unstable balance. But I, I'm, I'm curious as to how you, how you see this playing out and whether, are, are you, are, are, to, some, to some degree, are we talking about a new transition, which is for the, one of the, perhaps the first time in the world more ide idealistic, more ideationally driven than past transitions, or is there a, an understanding of material forces there that I don't, that I don't have? Yeah. That's a terrific question. Um, you know, there's a, in terms of the historic transition, there is a vast, as you know, there's a vast literature and a lot of debate about, you know, what are the dynamics driving that. And I'm not sure it's, it's a, it would be fair to characterize Marxist as the Marxist tradition as seeing it as sort of a material base with the culture sitting on top, since that's more of a Marxoid thing. And if you you know, and in, and in fact, the the, <coughs> the 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 argument I'm most comfortable with is in, in understanding these historical transition is is to not make that sharp distinction. And and when when different modes of development tend to gain coherence. It's because of the interaction, I think, between the ideas and the material drivers that underpin those ideas. And I think, uh, I, I think we're going to return uh, later today, I, I know we're going to return later today, to the question about whether or not some of the dynamics that, for example, led to nationalism uh, over the last several centuries might be playing out in slightly different forms and that some of those material conditions may be at play now. I think the point that you the way I process your point, and I feel most challenged by your point, when is when it comes to agents of change. It seems that in the past, people were, tra transitions were kicked forward uh, because of crises in the earlier arrangements, and often driven by people who were materially, either would enjoy benefits by the change, or were suffering. You know, whether it was workers in the union movements, or African Americans in the civil rights movement, and so on and so forth. And in that sense, this particular transition, I think, is new, because it really is requiring that people think not only of their own Im 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 immediate well-being and the elimination of immediate wrongs, but also to take into consideration the larger project of their children, their grandchildren, and generations to come, and, you know, which is the essence of the sustainable development idea. And it remains an open question whether uh, that can be a sufficient galvanizing force for people to you know, see that and, and be alive to that, and, and whether that could you know, bring out that sense of uh, common purpose and feeling connected to that idea to advance a great transition. So I think that need to both to look forward decades, generations, as part, not only, but as part of of what it takes to combine the question of dealing with the problem of the environment, the problem of current generations, and the problem of future generations, is a, a challenge that we haven't known historically. And it, it remains to be seen. My premise is that it is possible. And I think we need to act as if it's possible. Uh, and that's the only way we'll know. Uh, we were talking yesterday, uh, we often use this metaphor of a supersaturated liquid. You know, if you remember your high school chemistry, if you keep putting sugar into it. Well, as we give these scenario talks around, we find so many people in different uh, uh, aspects of civil society activism, or just regular citizens, are very responsive when you 
able to show this kind of sense of different stories about the future. And our premise is that it's a supersaturated liquid, that it's ready to be born. And we need to try to tap on that glass to see if that's possible. And, and then we'll be able, be able to answer your question, I hope, in the affirmative. Yeah. Um, I hope you don't take this as a semantic quibble. I, it mm -hmm. seems as though we've got a couple terms that are being interchanged, uh, transition, transformation in particular. And transition, uh, I'm sort of a Worfian in, in my roots a little bit, and it implies a kind of linear uh, progression in which we, we take really part of the past with us. And a transformation, if you look in biology, if you take extend that metaphor beyond chemistry, uh, the caterpillar, uh, there's nothing left when that transformation happens. It's a real major qualitative uh, shift. And uh, it sounds like in what you're leading to is, the transfer, is a transformation here rather than a, a transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you uh, take transformation to be a change in the structural organization of the socio-ecological system, then we are talking about a structural shift, but not one that totally leaves the past behind. I mean, even today within you know, in industrial culture, there are, are powerful remnants of all of the earlier ones overlaid in some kind of palimpsest. Uh, so uh, it's a mixture of both structural, trans of both continuity and change. But in a way, um, that's a bit of a dodge because I essentially agree with you, but we had a problem. The Great Transformation was already taken. It was a book by Carl Polanyi in the 19th, a great book, by the way, in the 1930s. So we thought for clarity we'd better find another word, but uh, I'm happy to use the word transformation. <laughs> Am I calling on people? Uh, yeah. Actually, the people with the microphones are calling. <laughs> <laughs> actually, the people who hand the microphones are calling. Um, back on the uh, sort of the Hegelian versus um, Marxian dialectics business, um, one thing I would throw out on the idea side is that if you're saying that the previous transitions had a, a more material base, but take a look at and you know, if we take the, the transitions that have been mentioned, the, the hunting gathering, the agricultural, the industrial, well, those were quite material. I mean, they're about as material as I guess we get. <laughs> However, if we're talking about an information, knowledge, spiritual, et cetera, that's not so material. So maybe that's part of a, a way to argue for what you want to argue for. Hey, talk among yourselves. <laughs> Actually, I, I, it's, it's, uh, when I raise the question, I, I raise it because I really don't have uh, a, a sense of, of, of the answer. But it, but it strikes me as an important, an important question to have on the table as we go through the day. Uh, the, I think Jerry's fundamentally right. I mean, there are more ideational characteristics of, 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 of the, the economic foundation uh, for this transition than there were for for previous ones, uh, and and that and that uh, that gives rise to some 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 hope for a more idealistic, ideationally driven uh, transition. But at the same time, I I I have to admit to some skepticism. I, I looked when I, your 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 three column tr transition uh, slide with the conventional, uh, the the conventional worlds on on on, on my left, the uh, the the. Uh, 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 barbarization uh, on the on the in the middle and the uh, the great transitions on the right, uh, that one right there exactly. Uh, conventional world, the mar market forces are, are are clearly driven. Globalization is clearly driven by 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 firms, by entrepreneurs, by economic interests, policy reform by by governments. I mean the agent the agent base of those is clear. Uh, it is to to me, to me to a very considerable degree in fortress world and breakdown. Even in eco -com communalism, it is to some degree um, people. Trying to escape from from uh, a, a disruptive environment uh, there, and, and and retreat into a world that they control. New sustainability, the the agent structure and the interests that drive those agents is the least clear of all of those up there to me, uh, and 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 that's why I, I I struggle with understanding that that uh, agent driven uh, a characterization, that material base for for getting there. 
Well, I mean, if you're persuaded that there is a, you know, roots in ideas and in motives for the policy reform scenario, those certainly carry through to the new sustainability paradigm. Because the new sustainability idea is both a push and a pull. And part of the push is concern, it's, it's fear, it's apprehension about security, about potential for crisis, about the instabilities in the world, uh, as, as well as a pull towards you know, lifesty lifestyles that, such as would drive an eco-communalism uh, worldview. Um, as well as, and, and this part gets, I think, the most distant from what has happened historically, with the sense that being a citizen in a global society becomes like a material force. With the formation of nationalism, you wouldn't have nationalism if there hadn't been a way of figuring out an idea of national identity. So it, it had a powerful ideational aspect to, to the, at that level as well. Earlier on, and you know, I, sh I should let David Frumkin speak to this stuff, but I mean, earlier on, the, the, the fact that you had coherence between, in the Middle Ages, between the religious viewpoint and some of the hierarchies in society was a necessary way of keeping the coherence and stability. So I, I think it's too radical to separate these various uh, aspects historically. So I think the fact that there is a material basis emerging at the global level for seeing ourselves as more connected to uh, the whole global system provides you know, the, the soil on which globalism or a global identity can begin to sprout. And then you get a possibility for a reunification of, of the pull and the push, the material and the ideational. The power of the microphone. Sure. <laughs> I guess my question would be, if this is a new kind of great transformation, then is there anything in past great transformations that helps us think about it? Or are, all, are there any common characteristics of past great transformations that would suggest that great transformations happen in specific ways or as a function of specific causes? And if so, then are there other possible great transformations that would behave as did historical transformations? Or is this, in fact, the kind of transformation that transforms transformations? Well, I think in a way that's what we're here for today is to try to explore that question. My own view is I see it as a kind of evolutionary phenomenon. And I take my metaphor from from evolution, and I'm not a directionalist. I don't see things as determined. I see them as emergent, carrying forward st structures and relationships from previous eras. But there's always going to be emergent phenomena. So I'm, but, uh, without answering your question directly, I think there are asp the, what interests me are the aspects of this transition that are new and require foresight. Uh, hi, Paul. Could you go to the slide on the global agents of change? Or sorry, I think there were three or four, including civil society and uh, an engaged public. I just want to make sure when I'm asking this question, I'm asking it based on the right stuff. <clears throat> I wonder whether or not we are, uh, and I think this slide sort of illustrates this question that I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, I wonder whether or not all of these conversations bias tr the transnational the uh, over the national. I mean, I was thinking about Sakiko's comment last night that China is responsible for half, uh, you know, China's 8% growth is responsible all by itself for, ha you know, the, the, uh, uh, the validity of the argument that globalization is helping developing nations. Uh, because its overwhelming success rate is sort of rising all the boats. So if you take those numbers apart, you see all this variation. I'm, uh, and the reason I'm asking this is what's interesting about this particular slide is it doesn't mention nation states. And so I'm curious about whether or not in this conversation we are excluding the power of these, of these extraordinary actors. And I, I'm not sure, and here's the question, do you get an aware and engaged public or global civil society or the rest of these without the active involvement of those nation states as single actors. Yeah. 
Uh, let me throw my voice through the chair here and invite other people to respond to some of these questions so we can have more of a, of a dialogue. I mean, these are, these are very fundamental questions. Did, uh, But, uh, are you are you you're being responsible? I I, I kind of am. I, I think the, the nation state. I mean, uh, I, I don't want to sort of give a direct response, but but I, I actually would also um, echo that the nation state, you know, is not going to wither away in all of this, and there's going to be uh, a role for that. But I wanted to sort of embellish the question slightly further, uh, and uh, on, on on the actors issue in two ways. Uh, one is uh, the comment you made about supersaturation, and I, I've seen that. I've seen you present this enough times. I've, I've seen the response. So, so that there's, there are people who are saying, "Well, I'm ready to make this change." I, I was wondering if you could also say where the um, the the other side that that doesn't want this change. Mm -hmm. So, so one is to think about who are the actors who will bring about the type of transition transformation you're talking about, mm -hmm. but who are the actors who might resist it. And the other sort of twist on this is, when I look at these, there are, as earlier comments suggested, clear actors for market forces, policy reform, eco-communalism. Uh, How would you react to the proposition that the actors who could propel new sustainability are actually all three of those actors? And new sustainability comes from a negotiated bargain between those three. Because in some ways, it's, it's, it's the confluence of those interests and previous transitions have also come not through single actors overwhelming others, but alliances being made, such as, for example, between church and, and, and ruler, mm -hmm. uh, ch church and state, and, and so on and so forth, for a transition to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, the, the, that, that maybe you're underselling who the actor for the new sustainability is. Right. Uh, well, I certainly simplify things here by talking in these sort of pure archetype ways. And I, what I tried to say earlier is that, you know, reality is a mixed state of these various tendencies, and probably none of these pure cases are going to form, or if they are more or less pure, they may vary regionally. It's a much more complicated world than presenting here. So there's no question that this process, you know, in, in, in the book, we, we tell the history of the future. You know, we had some fun from, from Dateline Mandela City 2068, looking back and tried to get a group of people together to to tell this story. And it's not a story of, easy story of just, everybody says, hey, why don't we have a great transition? It's a complicated story. It's full of crisis and setbacks and compromise. And even in 2068, it's not fulfilled, but it's moving in that direction. And, and there's a lot of residual problems. And, and, <clears throat> and by the way, the same initial conditions and the same kinds of, of story elements can be used to tell any of these scenarios. And, the thing that we learned the most about in doing this exercise is not so much, uh, you know, how to, you know, tell these compelling stories because what really happens will be n nothing that any of us can imagine here. But what the lesson really is, what happened before the crisis? What happened before the surprise? So you could, ha we have a crisis in 2015. Get ready. Uh, and uh, it can lead to a fortress, out of that can come a fortress world or all sorts of, of different things. But the critical element was what happened in terms of awareness, in terms of preparation, in terms of the discussions and negotiations prior to the crisis. And that we can do something about, even though we don't know exactly when the crisis is or, what it's, or what its character will be. So this is a very complicated aspect. And certainly the nation state's not going to wither <laughs> on us. It is being challenged from below and above. Uh, you know, devolution and the idea of moving things in the downward and some subsidiarity idea is certainly a theme of our time. And at the same time, it's being challenged from above, although there are very important national actors uh, in countries, I think we happen to be sitting in one, that are hanging on to the, uh, the idea of lack of, you know, that we can do it alone uh, uh, and, and not really making its peace with the necessity of that interdependence. But I think there's powerful forces driving in that direction. If not, it may, if that doesn't happen, it may increase the pre probability or precondition for a fortress world. So it's going to be a player, but what form it takes really will depend on how the balance turns out as it gets stretched and pulled and, and, and transformed in this process. actually was uh, Mandela City and the role of leadership 
in all of this? I mean, uh, as you say, you're talking in terms of paradigms and uh, archetypes and so forth, but at some point those get cons consolidated in, in leadership, or at least leadership moves that forward. And how does that play a role? I mean, we don't have a Mandela to lead this right now. Mm -hmm. um, my view is that Mandela actually did do so, the, you know, the, the worldwide movement against apartheid and then the release and the celebration of Nelson Mandela, the person, actually did pull together a kind of global citizens movement in the last 20 years, yeah. which prefigures some of what you're saying. And I wondered how you feel that might play out or is there a way that that could be fostered? Yeah. Where, where are the leaders? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not thinking of Schwarzenegger here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's a, again, there's a whole literature on the relationship between the individual and, and, and social movements. My own sense is that individuals don't make movements, that movements are, can be ready to be born, and individuals can be the carrier of that and can reflect it back on people and thus amplify the process. But the, it has to be historically ready to be born. Uh, the reason we're doing all this is we think this is historically ready to be born because of the material aspects, but also an increasing uh, number of people all over the world because of how they want to live their lives and the kind of world they want to be in and so on. Uh, and so, again, we, leadership may be a more modest thing these days. It may not be, uh, you know, the, the kind of charismatic know, leader that sort of draws people to that vision. It may be inviting people to consider a proposal. It might be tapping on that glass that I mentioned earlier and seeing, uh, and seeing what crystallizes. Uh, so I think until one shows up, the, there's nobody here but us chickens. And I don't, I'm not referring to the earlier talk either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tarek, what, Tarek has a question. Yeah, um, I want to go back to the question that uh, this gentleman here asked, uh, and you know maybe offer something uh, you know along the lines to follow up on, on on what you just said said in response. I mean, this issue of the nation state is is absolutely fundamental. It seems to me, um, and not only China. Uh, actually, you know, one very interesting statistic of the last 50 years is that uh, since 1950, global inequality has increased. Dramatically, I mean, I mean, it's almost unimaginable that something like this could happen. But national inequality in any country has not increased appreciably. You know, I mean, if you if you put all the countries together and you look at the index of inequalities, it's it's you know it's just off the charts. Mm. But if you take any country, you find just marginal changes, little bit up, little bit down, and and so on. And you know, in some sense, it sort of gives the idea that at the nation state, regardless of whether it's a democracy or authoritarian that there is some sense of a political community and some, some sense of political processes that keep uh, market processes, harness them to some uh, social and, and, and other ends. And so in some sense, the nation state has, has played a, a very significant role and you know, in all likelihood will continue to play. But as we look to the future, one thought that does occur to me is that if you look at the coming into being of the nation state, um, a lot of the earlier affiliation, you know, like tribal or local, did sort of erode a little bit, but in places where the nation state itself was uh, either malgoverned or corrupt or authoritarian, those identifications actually became intensely pathological in character. They did not, not only did they not disappear, they actually took over the nation state, you know, and made the nation state hostage to its this thing. Now, in some sense, as we look at the planetary civilization, if our system of governance is one based on democracy and transparency and responsibility, we could expect the nation state to become less important, perhaps even wither away, who knows. But given the way, direction in which we are going, it is more likely actually to become pathological in nature and actually keep the planet hostage as, as part of its system. And in some sense, you know, the, the right, the, the, the middle and the right uh, diagrams actually bring this out that the, the, the role of the nation state is somehow implicit in what we, what we see. Uh, to follow up on that, the, the idea of looking at who perhaps is resistant to these changes, transitions, and transformations, uh, I think to look at the nation state as some inevitable continuity is maybe misguided. And uh, it's being challenged right now in a severe way to transform by asymmetric 
uh, warfare. And the net war philosophers are saying, if nation states do not become networks, they will fade away, and, and not in a happy way. Uh, and, and yet, the nation state is the first element of the immune system to push back the emergent transformations. Uh, like in the butterfly, uh, in the caterpillar, the immune system destroys those first imaginal cells in the transformational process. So uh, I think in one sense, that's the critical lever, the nation state, uh, either adapt or die. Um, and what comes from a network, uh, a nation state turned to a network, um, maybe things to look at. Mm -hmm. Well, there are contradictions and tensions all through this system. In a way, there are tensions between the integrity of the preservation of the prerogatives of the nation state and the forces driving market forces. So in other words, you know, if, if uh, those who see their interest as coupled to forging this like market system internationally can come into conflict with a, with a myopic form of nationalism. So there are, there are conflicts and contradictions even between those that might be the precursors of a fortress world and the market forces, let alone with great, <laughs> all these things are problem. All these, all these are utopian visions. They're all problematic and full of, uh, rife with contradictions and conflict. Um, you know, on the other hand, I think there is emerging uh, within, especially with each generation, a greater sense of the reduction of the intensity of the identification uh, at the nation state level. Probably with American exceptionalism, we have to say here. Uh, um, and more of a sense that, you know, through the internet, through, you know, the, through this notion of climate change, through being, becoming aware of the linkage of poverty and, and polarization and terrorism and all these things, I think there's more of a conversation happening and more of a kind of a destabilization of the old pieties of, you know, about, about, nation, about nationalism. But they're not formed. And they may, you know, it may be, some, uh, you know, all of the people some of the time and some of the people all of the time. But, uh, you know, the, but the elements are in there, for, I think, for this kind of upwelling of, uh, of, breaking, of questioning and destabilizing these old categories of, of ideology and, and self-identity. That is the opening, I think, for <laughs> For leadership, for putting, for, for awareness building, for having these discussions, and for the possibility of a rather rapid phase shift, and that's, I, you know, I think the, the potential source of hope. The one slide you put up there that I thought really captured it for me, rather than these scenarios, had to do with the slide on uh, proximate. Uh, co causes of transition and ultimate causes of transition. And I don't know if you could put that slide up. That, that's the one, number 19. Um, in many ways, I thought that really captured it. Whether you talk about scenarios or not, when you see uh, rapid uh, transitions in the underlying ultimate drivers, be it values or, or, or in s science or in uh, power structure some, or cultural, one can think of, say, the civil rights movement. Um, there really was a cultural transformation in this country during the 50s and 60s, um, largely driven by uh, television, making people very keenly aware of what it really was like in a certain part of this country for certain people. And what one can think that nation states are one form of player on those four ultimate drivers, but not the only driver. Um, there has been a huge homogenization of cultural values throughout the world in the last 50 years, um, be it on issues of race, be it on issues of democracy. Um, and there really is a, a, almost a global consensus on certain things. And I think as we see at times of conflict, a real focus on nationalism, actually I think that may distract us from a much more significant uh, consensus, global consensus, that has been forming. And it's not uh, been triggered by one event, be it a war or something, but it has been a gradual evolution. And that, that drive, when I think about 
today's conversations and things. That diagram, for me, captures it more than anything else I've seen so far. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I mean, just to add, I do think that, that the formation you know, of, of that new zeitgeist uh, is decades old. That's what I was trying to say in an earlier slide, going from the World Wars to the UN and so, the, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 48. Uh, I've been involved myself in this thing called the Earth Charter, uh, which working with Stephen Rockefeller and the Dalai Lama, and I, who knows who, um, and trying to come up with a formulation about an ethic, what is a, a reasonable ethical basis that would be a, you know, kind of a soft law document in parallel with the, with the Declaration of Human Rights. And you know, there's conversations going on all, all over the place, they're bubbling around. Our concern at this point, you know, as we sit here today, is that much of the awareness of these problems and possibilities has, has gotten channeled more into that localist vision uh, and more into a sense of protest as opposed to positive vision and still remains quite fragmented across a lot of different issues. And that uh, the next big idea <laughs> is uh, to see if we can try to put all these things together in a large tent, in a large conversation that seeks those negotiations, that assumes trust, that pushes the boundaries of where dialogue could happen and see how, how far one can bring uh, you know, this global citizens movement uh, into reality. Well. Keeping on this chart, I wonder if you could talk to the role of the knowledge technologies as drivers and it, whether or not the knowledge technologies are bringing about a merging of the material and ideational forces because there are ways in which the material economic uh, well-being is depending more and more on the knowledge economy. And so I, I wonder if you could talk about uh, the role of learning and knowledge um, as integrating the elements that you have there as drivers. Right. Well, I certainly hesitate to do that in a room full of professors. But the, um, I don't know if at Boston University I can go down the hall here and find the Department of Sustainability Science or the Department of Sustainability Studies. Uh, most universities, you cannot. It, uh, so. The kinds of systemic approaches to knowledge that recognizes the normative as in internal to the, to the uh, cognitive problem. Uh, I think it's an incipient idea. I think we're in a period of pre-professionalization here, like once there was no chemistry and once there was no physics. And people are doing that. Sometimes it's called complexity theory. Some, you know, sometimes it's called integrated assessment and there, there are meetings. But it hasn't actually formed. To, uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a, an academically legitimate way that gets penetrated into the educational system to understand socio-ecological systems, the co-evolution of society and the environment and in, in, their, in their dialectical interactions and, and as, as one system. And that's part of what we have in mind here is to try to argue that in, until we get beyond a reduction, now this is coming, I'm a, theoretical particle physicist, so I, I know all about reductionism and the idea of building up systems from their basic uh, entities. Uh, but that itself is, you know, there's questions about you know, the sufficiency of that. I mean, I don't think it is sufficient, you know, I, and I think that, that the heritage of that philosophy of science has, has prevented this idea of this interdisciplinarity, this idea of creating not just, no, actually more than that, be going beyond inter, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity. Is that the word you use? To uh, kind of a new science of systems, uh, of socio-ecological socio systems. Um, but then I think also, you know, I talk about agents of change. I didn't talk about the media, about educators, and so on, because it's only through those processes that this knowledge and understanding starts actually penetrating, uh, you know, the, the awareness and gives legitimacy to these ideas. Uh, so to dance around your question, there's my answer. <laughs> Thank you once again, Paul.